So the first speaker uh, today is uh, Professor Richard Somerville. He is a distinguished professor emeritus and research professor at the Chief Institution of Russia and Coffee, University of California, San Diego, USA. So, Richard, you have to share. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be in Belgrade again, and it's an honor to be the first speaker in this plenary session. I want to say a few words about this uh, topic that I've chosen because I hope it will be of wide interest. The, I'm going to talk a little bit about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I want to make clear at the start that I'm talking only about the Working Group 1 of IPCC, the Physical Sciences part of IPCC, and uh, not the Working Groups 2 and 3 that deal with uh, topics like mitigation and adaptation and impacts and vulnerability. But I have two questions in mind with this uh, topic of, uh, of the future uh, sea level rise projections. The first is scientific. How do we make these projections? And what do very recent discoveries uh, mean in terms of uh, modifications to these projections? And secondly, uh, how do we assess these projections uh, through organizations like the IPCC, which are charged with uh, making assessments of climate science uh, with the audience of policymakers and the media and the public in mind, and the criteria being that the assessments will be scientific, that is, they will be relevant to policy, but not prescriptive of policy. So with that in mind, I'd like, my, this story starts for me about 10 years ago. I was a coordinating lead author, that's IPCC jargon for a chapter head for the fourth assessment report, the one published in 2007. And during this assessment report, uh, we learned that there was, uh, there was some issues with verifying the projections of sea level rise from the previous reports, the IPCC first, second, and third assessment reports. And so this happened in 2006, and so we published a paper. And I'm a co-author on this paper. Stefan Ramsdorf from Potsdam is the lead author. There were about six co-authors. And what you're looking at here is the figure that's the main result of this, uh, this paper here that top figure uh, shows uh, a carbon dioxide concentration uh, over roughly the last three and uh, fraction decades. The <coughs> observed uh, healing curve uh, is up here. The IPCC projections are this narrow band. This is the, the temperature, the global mean Earth surface temperature. Uh, the observations go up and down here due to the natural variability, um, mainly the El Nino La Nina oscillation and the rise. Of course, the uh, recent warming in recent decades. And this is this gray area here, and these lines give the range and the, the median of the IPCC projections from the first three assessment reports. You can see that for carbon dioxide and temperature, uh, if you mentally smooth out this observed line, it is consistent with the IPCC projections. But for the sea level, which is this last figure here, uh, the red is the uh, you know, measurement. Five pages for human and satellite activity in the modern era. And you can see that the sea level observations uh, we consistently uh, sit near the top of the range of IPCC projections from the first three assessment reports. This work was done in 2006, published on the same day in 2007 that the IPCC released the summary for policymakers from working group one of these four assessment reports. So it only deals with the first three assessment reports. What we said in the conclusion of this one-page paper, which was come inside hundreds of times, is the following. That overall, these data from observations underscore concerns about climate change. And we say that previous projections, summarized by IPCC, have not exaggerated, but may in some respects even have underestimated the change, in particular for sea level. So we call attention to the fact that this IPCC sea level projections from the earlier reports appear to have been biased low. Now if you look at sea level in the fourth assessment report, um, this is a summary of it here, 
Uh, this is the report released in 2007, and the authors chose to give sea level projections for the last decade of this century, using as a baseline the last two decades of the previous century. And you'll recall that there were several scenarios, and the models were run uh, for these scenarios. The lowest means low emissions of heat trapping gases, like CO2, and the highest scenario is here. No mitigation is included in any scenario. And so the range of models uh, driven by these low emissions was uh, 18 to 38 centimeters of sea level rise, at least by this definition. And, and for the highest one, the models range from 26 to 59. So the widely quoted range was from the low end of the low scenario to the high end of the high scenario, 18 to 59 centimeters, with an important caveat that IPCC made very explicitly, but which was not always uh, covered by the press and by summaries of the IPCC report. The IPCC said these estimates really only deal with mechanisms of sea level rise that are thermal expansion of the ocean plus water added to the ocean from melting of ice on land. They don't take into account possible changes in what IPCC called future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow which is jargon for ice sheets in the Arctic region. Because we didn't then have observational data, and we didn't then have uh, trustworthy models of those. So this was a range of sea level rise due only to the more well understood mechanisms. Now, that was AR5, the fourth, AR4, the fourth assessment report. If you jump ahead to AR5, it's a big report. It's thousands of pages long. I'm sure you have read all of them. But just in case you haven't, I've summarized AR5 on only two slides. This is severe compression here. So you'll hear a lot more about this report at this meeting. But here are the simple conclusions uh, from the fifth assessment report that was issued uh, last fall. The, the climate system is warming. The dominant cause is human activities. The warming has not stopped. There's no pause or hiatus or whatever you like to call it. 90 plus percent of the heat added to the climate system in recent decades is to be found in the ocean. Ice is shrinking, both ice on land and sea ice generally, because the growth in Antarctic sea ice is far smaller than the shrinkage of Arctic sea ice. And uh, that's half the report. Here's the other half. Um, we know a lot about carbon dioxide. The pH of the ocean is decreasing. It's becoming more acidic. The concentration in the air is 40% higher than it was in the middle 1800s when human activity began increasing it. Probably the highest amount in at least 800,000 years. And the 10th and 11th points here summarize a very complicated uh, carbon cycle theory and very uh, complicated uh, climate sensitivity results in this simple statement that it is the cumulative emissions of CO2 and other heat trapping gases that determine the, the uh, amount of the warming and that for any given uh, limit that you'd like to set on the warming, we can prescribe a reduction in emissions that will give a reasonable chance of meeting that limit. And the last point simply says that on human time scales, many of the changes are irreversible so that the climate system that you get after you've emitted these gases and waited a little while, will last for a long time. And that's because there's long time scales here, including long time scales in the ocean and in parts of the carbon cycle. Now, the fifth assessment report did a wonderful job of working on sea level rise. And I'm not criticizing the scientists um, who wrote it. It's chapter 13. I highly uh, recommend it. And here's um, what the results were in terms that are comparable to the results I already gave. If you, the AR5 dealt with a different uh, set of scenarios, as you may know, but there's enough information in the chapter so that we can say what the projections of AR5 would have been for the same uh, measure that AR4 used, the sea level rise in the last decade of the current century compared to the last two decades of the previous one. And this, instead of the AR4 range, which is here again, 18 to 59 centimeters, you get the much higher range, more than 50% higher, of AR4, that 18 has now become 28, 59 has now become uh, almost one meter for the same scenario. And that's because the models that were used, which are process models, that is complex numerical models of the physical processes that I mentioned before, the thermal expansion and uh, melting of ice on land, are, the models are, have been refined, they've been given higher, uh, <coughs> uh, higher results for the same input. But 
Regarding a second class of models, models that were introduced in 2006 and the results were made known, but they hadn't been published in time for use of AR4, but they're now published with a whole bunch of them. These so-called semi-empirical models, instead of trying to model the process, say, well, we don't know a lot about the important parts of the process, so let's uh, simply use a statistical correlation between the observed past sea level rise and the observed past warming. And there's a variety of these models, and they tend to give results up to twice as high as AR4. But AR5 authors of chapter 13 um, considered them very carefully, discussed them in detail, and said, on balance, they had low confidence in the projections by these statistical models, so we will continue to rely on uh, process-based uh, models. And they uh, made this uh, very explicit in the chapter. That was a decision that they took after very, very extensive deliberation. That's all I'm going to say about AR5 for the moment. But there's another, uh, there's actually several other climate assessments that come out. I mentioned several of them in the preprint that you have in your preprint uh, book. But in this uh, short time here, I want to uh, focus on one of them. It was an assessment made in the United States, the same kind of assessment as the IPCC with the same sort of goal, but it's an assessment made in the USA and released in May of this year, and it's called the National Climate Assessment. It's actually the third uh, one. And, uh, and it, it's written for a United States audience, so you have these very strange units that you may have heard about called feet. Because um, in the United States, um, except for scientists and a few other people, uh, ordinary people don't use meters and kilograms, and they'll be bewildered if you issue these results, and they've been translated. You may notice, by the way, that one feet to uh, four feet here is about uh, 30 to 120 centimeters, so it's comparable to this uh, uh, range of, uh, <coughs> of the AR5 process models. But the American assessment, the US assessment, said for those interested in risk of sea level rise, you may want to consider a wider range, which is this area in white that doesn't show up very well on the screen here, but you can see where it's missing. And it ranges from 0.66 feet, which is 18 centimeters, the low range of AR4, up to 2 meters, which is the high range of the, the semi-empirical models. So in short, the, the authors of the US assessment made a different choice. They said, we're going to give the process uh, models uh, emphasis here, but we're also going to cite the results from a different class of models. And maybe that's reasonable. After all, I'm a climate modeler, and if you think of the way global climate models are used in these assessments, we use a whole hierarchy of models, ranging from coupled ocean atmosphere, uh, detailed four-dimensional global climate models, through models of uh, intermediate complexity and uh, uh, assessment models of all kinds. There's a hierarchy of models, each member of which has its own strengths and weaknesses, and so they can be used judiciously uh, by experts who understand these, instead of simply relying on one class of, of models. So here's an example of another expert assessment, similar uh, degree of effort to the IPCC assessment that made a separate choice. I'll return to that. Uh, meanwhile, we now have better observations. These are largely from the great satellite uh, data uh, of the loss of, of, of uh, ice mass in both Greenland and Antarctica. And it is uh, it's, it's, uh, both uh, ice sheets and, uh, on, the, on Greenland and Antarctica are contributing to sea level rise, and we know that today for a fact. And furthermore, the contribution is important, and it's increasing with time. Now I want to turn to a little bit of history here. When you get to be my age, you get interested in history. And here's a prediction made 36 years ago by John Mercer, who was a very distinguished uh, glaciologist. And he published it in Nature with the uh, terrifying title, West Antarctic Ice Sheet and CO2 Greenhouse Effect, A Threat of Disaster. So you can't say he avoided uh, uh, emotional or uh, language. And here's a summary of what this little paper says. Mercer was the kind of guy who uh, actually went to Antarctica and measured things on the ice. He was a, a very individualistic and uh, <clears throat> an effective scientist who has inspired many of today's glaciologists. And he wrote in 1978, if global con consumption of fossil fuels continues, CO2 will double in about 50 years, and the warming that that causes could start rapid degreciation of West Antarctica, leading to a five meter rise in sea level. Well, that's a serious forecast. And this was the first mention 
of what has come to be called in English a tipping point or an instability, a sudden regime change, the passing of a threshold that gives rise to a large change in the climate system rather than a gradual one. And it's interesting, this has been known for a long time. Mercer's not the only person to have come up with this idea. So the glaciology community has known for a long time that there's a mechanism in Antarctica, and I'll explain it in a moment in more detail, that could lead uh, to this kind of, of uh, sea level rise. Meanwhile, there are some very recent observations. These observations were published in May of this year. The scientist is Eric Vigneault, a French scientist working in California. And what you're looking at here is this little section of West Antarctica, the Amundsen Sea sector. And these are glaciers, Pine Island, Thwaites, Haines, and so on, that drain the West Antarctic ice sheet. So ice is flowing down these glaciers into the sea. And it's well known that when that happens, a portion of the ice, the ice shelf, is floating, and the portion of the ice is grounded on land. And icebergs can calf off the floating part, and the place where the transition is is called the grounding line. And I don't have time to tell you the details, but they're fascinating. Mignot's group studied observationally the movement of the grounding line. So there's floating ice out here, there's ice on land in here, and this line is retreating towards the continental interior, and he can measure the rate of it. And the, one of the ways that's done is because the floating ice rises and falls with the tides, you see tidal oscillations in the satellite altimetry data, whereas the ice that's grounded on land doesn't rise and fall with the tides. So you can track these grounding lines in their motion. The color code here is down here, so the dark red here is ice that's uh, grounding lines that are retreating inland uh, by more than three kilometers per year. Very rapid uh, retreat. And we know, and his group, uh, felt they had enough data to have the following uh, conclusion. It's published, but here's what he said at a press conference. He said, <clears throat> he used the term collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, as Mercer had done 36 years earlier. And he says, we've concerned <clears throat> that uh, we now have enough, uh, enough data uh, to conclude that the retreat of ice in the Amundsen Sea sector of the West Antarctic ice sheet is unstoppable with major consequences. This means the tipping point has been passed. Sea levels will rise one meter worldwide, and what's more, the disappearance of this uh, West Antarctic ice sheet will likely uh, trigger the collapse of the rest of the West Antarctic ice sheet, aside from this Amundsen Sea portion. And that includes a sea level rise of between uh, three and five meters. Such an event, in your remarks, will displace millions of people worldwide. Now, it's important to note that this will not happen tomorrow morning. This uh, process, the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet that uh, these observations indicate is underway, uh, if the result is borne out, if the community agrees with Renault and company, uh, this may take place over several centuries, and we don't know how many centuries. There's a great uncertainty at the present state of the science as to how long it will take for this process to unfold. But the mechanism is essentially unstoppable. Once it has started, there's no uh, reason to think that it will stop. And I'm going to explain the mechanism in a second, but <clears throat> it's important to note that this is brand new work just published in May, and there's corroborating research uh, from numerical models. These uh, two papers, one in GRL and one in science, uh, came out together. This is the numerical work here. Renaud's paper uh, is the observational work. The references are in my, uh, in my extended abstract. And <clears throat> so these two papers, uh, conclude that there's an unstoppable collapse is the jargon term for what happens to the ice shape. Thus, the tipping point that had been predicted decades ago has now been passed. Again, assuming that this work, like all of brand new science, is borne out by, by other investigators. The mechanism that uh, uh, one has in mind is shown here. It's not my diagram. I found it on the internet, so I got lazy and just stole it. And so this is land down here. Here's the ice sheet. Uh, uh, flowing from left to right. Here's the floating part of it, the ice shelf, which can break up and tear off icebergs. And this, in this illustration here, there's a topographic feature in the sea bottom uh, that uh, prevents the ice sheet from moving further. But in the region where Renault and others uh, have studied, the sea floor has been mapped, again, from satellite data, and there is no pinning point. And so there's nothing to stop the process once it starts because the seafloor slopes downward uh, toward the continental interior. Uh, much of the land in Antarctica is below sea level, and so it can continue to slope downward. 
And the melting occurs because the relatively warmer ocean water uh, can circulate under here and help to melt the base of the sheet. So this grounding line here, the difference between ice on land and ice that's floating, is moving from right to left. And it's that process and the downward slope, uh, the lack of pinning points, the seafloor sloping downward from right to left that uh, makes it uh, uh, unstoppable once it starts and it has apparently started. Okay, that's the end of the science portion. I have a few pictures to show you before we go on to the assessment part. Uh, so again, this is Antarctica seen from space, and the region we're talking about is right here. Uh, West Antarctica is roughly the left-hand half of this, and it's the warmer half. And the greatest warming, you know, it occurs on the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, which leads up to the tip of South America. But the uh, West Antarctica is warmer, is warming more than, than East Antarctica. Uh, all the detail is unimportant, but it's interesting to note if you're not an expert on this area, and I'm not, uh, that 98% uh, of Antarctica is ice covered, and most of the fresh water on Earth is there. It's in, it's in ice in Antarctica. Uh, there's very little precipitation, it's very cold, uh, so uh, the, the ice is losing mass because the loss of ice from melting and calving icebergs is far greater than the gain of ice from snowfall. I've already mentioned the fact that the land is below sea level. Again, that's due to the heavy weight of the ice. Uh, it's, uh, I think I've, I've uh, said all this, so here's another picture showing where the major ice shelves are here in the west, just to orient you. It's, these ice sheets uh, are generally thought to be more than 30 million years old, and they're thick. The average ice sheet is between two and three kilometers thick, and they cover the land and part of the ocean and lakes and everything else in Antarctica. And it's the West Antarctic ice sheet that's at risk, but it doesn't rule out a later uh, similar process in the east. More dramatic photographs here. And uh, the ice uh, shelves, these parts here, are, can be up to a kilometer thick. They're, they are big. And it's the buoyancy of the ice and uh, its grounding on pinning points that keeps the, the uh, glaciers or the ice sheets from, uh, from draining much more rapidly. You know, these things flow like fluids, but slowly. And here again, a picture from uh, some, showing some historical context. It's 1980 on the left, near the present on the right. And here uh, you see the, a range of predicted sea level rise from a variety of models dating uh, back uh, to the early 90s. And you can see that the, the uh, sea level rise has decreased with time. It tends to move downwards to here. But the uncertainties, which are these ranges on each of these bars, has also decreased. So the, uh, this is AR4 in 2007. And you can see that uh, this is the 18 to 59 centimeters. So it's uh, lower and with lower error bars than the, <coughs> than the uh, previous IPCC reports. And here in the green is, uh, for sample, a typical range of a so-called semi-empirical model, which can be a factor of two higher than the range of the process models on which IPCC has relied. OK. In my mind, there are several interesting questions that is, are raised by this. And I'm going to talk now only about science questions. There's a whole other set of questions uh, dealing, for example, with the way the media and the political process have or have not responded to this event. Reno's announcement got a day in the newspapers and on some television. But uh, the fact that the world may be in, inescapably for a sea level rise of several meters um, has, I think, uh, largely slipped below the the horizon of many, many non-scientists. But I think there's several questions. And one of them here has to do with the, the use in IPCC and other assessments of a kind of consensus process. To my mind, consensus makes sense when the research frontier has moved on and left relatively settled science in its wake. I think that's the right time to talk about um, a consensus. But there are areas of active research, and I think sea level rise is clearly one of them, where the expert community is still pursuing different approaches, and where the relative merits of different kinds of sea ice model projections are, are debated and still in a state of flux. And so I wonder whether IPCC and other assessments might better serve their announced purpose of informing the policymaking world and the public if instead of of forcing themselves to converge to a consensus with many outliers, 
whether they would uh, instead talk about the different approaches and cite the different ways of estimating uh, sea level rise projections in for the future. I think that might give a more accurate sense. And I think the US assessment result that I quoted, which again is very recent, just happened in May of this year, was an effort uh, to, uh, to do that. I was part of that assessment process, and people debated very seriously and at great length the pros and cons of different kinds of, of, uh, of assessments and projections. I think another question that arises here is that if we think that several meters of sea level rise will happen after 21, if the, the expert community converges on the view that this tipping point has been passed, sea level rise will play out over centuries, but will be unstoppable by as far as we know, then perhaps we should say it. Perhaps it would help uh, policymakers and those concerned with infrastructure and coasts and so on uh, if we say we're looking far beyond 2100. Sea level rise doesn't stop at 2100. It certainly continues for centuries. We've known that for a long time. And perhaps the asymptotics of this problem, the fact that there's an ultimate rise of several meters, will be more useful. Again, I think the consensus process tends to favor avoiding reporting extreme uh, outcomes and, and uh, avoiding emphasizing the views of, of outliers. But here is an example where it might be sense to consider carefully the pros and cons of, of telling more than has been done by just citing a single consensus. And the third of the three questions that I think this, uh, this work uh, gives rise to is the question of whether these assessments are intellectually conservative. I don't mean politically conservative or liberal or anything like that, but whether the, the process tends to favor uh, a underestimation rather than an overestimation of, uh, of the dangers. Because after all, the norms of, of science do favor objectivity and rationality and a lack of emotion, but sometimes nature is dramatic. And there's an interesting paper um, that I cited in the, in the uh, extended abstract by Brissa et al. It's paper number three in the reference list uh, there. And Brissa et al. have a very interesting perspective on this. They are historians of science and people involved in science studies. And they say, uh, Scientists are biased not toward alarmism, but rather the reverse, toward cautious estimates, where we define caution as erring on the side of less rather than more academic, uh, more alarming predictions. That's the tendency that they call erring on the side of least drama. And uh, they also remark that there's a tendency in the consensus process to obscure or avoid reporting uh, likelihoods of uh, extreme outcomes and outlying views. But when they are quite possible, and when it's simply a question of how long they take, um, maybe it's time uh, to think a little bit more about conveying the sense of drama, because after all, the, the processes that nature produces are sometimes uh, very dramatic. Thank you. <laughs>